Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. So that was uh, some kind of few days. It was an interesting 24 hours for sure. Something happened? You don't know how many times I had to recheck Elliot Friedman's tweet. It was only three words? Verona on waivers. Or yeah. whatever it was. And I checked and I double checked and I triple checked. I pulled up the account. I checked like the, the, the check mark was because it was, you know, legacy verified or because it's subscribed to Twitter Blue. Thank you, Elon, for that. <laughs> Closed the app, opened it again, blinked seven times. I think I texted our group chat. I texted our group chat with, with uh, Max and Prashanth. And then I finally like responded to it. <laughs> that has to be one of the most out of left field things to happen since we started covering the Red Wings. It was such a day of extremes and non-extremes because there was that, I think Daniela tweeted out in the morning how Lalone was saying, like, how can I pull Berger and Soderblom out of the, and Valeno out of the lineup right now? They're playing too good. And we're like, well, this is definitely not something that would have happened under the old regime. Um, waiver exempt, you're going down so we don't lose players. Adam Ernie was indicated to likely be the scratch at that point. Nadelkovic was going on. We're like, okay, this all makes perfect sense. And I think I even sent out a tweet along the lines. I'm like, wow, feels weird to finally have like this level of, you know, whatever you want to call it. And then two hours later, I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> I actually saw that tweet. I'm like, oh, that monkey paw is curling hard right now. Yeah, yeah. So Jacob Run has been placed on waivers. Jacob Run has cleared waivers. He is down in Grand Rapids. And Alex Nedeljkovic is with him. All three of the young guns who are waiver exempt are still with the Red Wings. Robbie Fabry is back, and Detroit Red Wings got trounced by New Jersey Devils last night. There's a lot to talk about this episode. Well, it's a good thing you summed it all up, and we can just end it here. Yeah, just like that, huh? Yeah. You have a cat to go adopt. That's so. right. That's right. All right, folks, uh, before we, we release Evan out into the world to uh, foster, and I'm using quotes because I do not believe in, in you and your better half's capacity to only foster cats, uh, we are going to talk about all things Detroit Red Wings, uh, the world of the NHL and international hockey. Actually, um, big game with uh, the World Juniors happened yesterday. Uh, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast, uh, we have an entire kind of timeline laid out for how Verona ended up on waivers, what the justification may have been, the whole story that we do know, uh, trying to piece together that puzzle. Uh, we'll talk about Ned and his conditioning stint. We'll talk about the Red Wings roster, um, Robbie Fabry coming back. Uh, we'll be talking about the news about when Bertuzzi and Zadina will be returning, uh, the World Juniors, and whatever other NHL news that we get to. Uh, and plenty more. But before all that, uh, I want to let you know that this podcast is a proud, proud supporter of the Jamie Daniels Foundation and their fight against against substance use disorder. Uh, one of the ways that we support them is through the Winged Wheel Podcast Nights at the LCA. That's an event partnered with the Detroit Red Wings, uh, where we host a live uh, episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast that we record before the game, uh, where there are special guests. We've had Ken Daniels and Mickey Redmond uh, a few times now. Uh, we have merch, we have giveaways, prizes, Q&A with a special guest, meet and greet. Uh, there's going to be food and drinks available, uh, all of that and more. And then we all head over to the game together. So uh, it is uh, a special Winged Wheel podcast discount on every ticket that you buy for the event. So it gets you access to the pregame uh, live recording and the Red Wings game itself on April 8th against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, you sit in Winged Wheel podcast specific sections. So we have the entire gondola booked out. We have upper and lower bowl seats. Uh, it's, a, it's a blast, and we always have an after-game uh, or post-game meetup and after-party, things like that. So uh, there's so much more. We are gonna we have some extra uh, surprises this time around that we're going to save for you. But for now, DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP if you want to get your tickets. Saturday, April 8th, DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. So Tuesday in the morning, we got uh, a trickle of news, I'll call it. Derek Lalone was saying things like Valeno, Soderblom, and Jansen Bergeron were playing so well that he could not justify pulling them out of the roster, which cued uh, 
which is this is never a good thing, but Brad's optimism. <laughs> and everyone was saying like, yeah, they've been great. Those three in different capacities have been really, really effective for the Red Wings. So waiver exempt or not, uh, they've been really, really, you know, integral to whatever success this team has had. So we said, oh, that's good. And then Derek Malone uh, and the Red Wings announced that Alex Ndokovic would be going down to Grand Rapids for a conditioning stint. He's not been playing. Uh, he's just kind of been scratched, not really taking the ice. Uh, he's still on the active roster for the conditioning stint, which is important. But that was their way of saying, and Derek Lalone actually said, we're sticking with Ned. We haven't given up on him. And I thought, oh, wow, that's good. I, I'm pretty surprised. I really thought that they would, you know, wave Ned before someone like Adam Ernie, for example. So we thought, okay, that's... That's the kid staying up. That's Nedeljkovic staying on the active roster, uh, even despite being on his conditioning stint. And then when they were doing drills uh, or, or practice, Adam Ernie was pulled out of his regular spot in the lineup in favor of Robbie Fabry, who made his uh, season debut against the New Jersey Devils last night on Wednesday. And then we thought, there it is. That's the last domino to fall. You make, uh, you make that roster spot by, by waving Adam Ernie. That's that. And then 2 p.m. runs around, and we see that Jacob Verona is on waivers. Aside from the initial shock, what were your first reactions? What? Yeah. That, that was the first word that like everyone I said, said. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah, it was... I was probably in a meeting on off mute, too. <laughs> like, Evan, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I will say, like... There are a few people, I, I said this uh, to Dmitry Filipovich as well, there are very few people in the know, like genuinely in the know in the Red Wings world uh, or in, in the NHL sphere. And anyone who I talked to who might have an inkling of this all had the exact same reaction. Everyone was floored by this. Uh, so yeah, Jacob Verona put on waivers and that just released a flurry of, of speculation. Here are the facts that we know. Uh, he had a three-game conditioning stint with Grand Rapids right at the end of 2022. Didn't really go that well in terms of game performance. He actually was one of the first ones to say that when interviewed. Um, not really what they wanted to see from him, and then they announced that they were going to extend that to the full two weeks. So however many days he was down in Grand Rapids, they were going to extend that to the full two weeks that they were allowed. But that was just you know shortly after the new year kicked off. So they really waived him before that two weeks was up. So yes, by waving him and him clearing, uh, they do buy more time with him being able to stay down in Grand Rapids and get in game shape. Cause right now it seems like he's still further away than maybe we all thought, but I don't know that this is, I don't know that, that, that I buy or that this really shakes out to be that they just really want him down in Grand Rapids. It would have to be a convoluted situation where they would risk waving him earlier than they, than they needed to because so much can happen in a week in terms of injuries and roster space and things like that. The problem in this scenario is there's a hundred things that could have caused this. If you look at this from a hockey perspective, it doesn't make sense which scares me because then it leads me to believe it might be one of the other things that I'm not going to speculate on. Because, you know, when this news broke, I wanted to wait and see until this all shook out to comment. And even then, I, I really only want to talk about this from a hockey perspective. The problem with that is, like I just said, from a hockey perspective, this doesn't make sense. You can argue, okay, Verona is not the greatest defensive player. We know that. A lot of players in the Red Wings four group who that qualifies. Does he fit into the loan system perfectly? We haven't really seen him under the loan system personally, uh, predominantly yet, so can't say for sure. But even if he doesn't, even if both those things are true, you don't waive him. He's one of the pr most proficient five on five goal scorers in the NHL. The whole thing with him coming over from Washington is he doesn't get a lot of ice time, but in the ice time he does get, he scores. So that's what everybody in Detroit was banking on when he came over. Sure enough, he comes over to Detroit, gets a little more ice time. Guess what? Those five-on-five -five numbers do not dip. 
he is still one of the most proficient five on five goal scorers in the NHL. Now, between injuries and you know entering the player assistance program, he's barely played, so the sample size this long into his tenure is still smaller. And you know, I've seen a lot of people saying your best ability is availability, and he hasn't had that, which is fair. But if the Red Wings didn't like who he was as a player, and they didn't want him in the system long term, and they don't see him as part of the future in the core, you retain half his salary and trade him, because. Without the other issues, he probably would have some value. Now comes the giant dark cloud over all of this, which is, it is there though. And that probably factors into it way more than any of us would like to admit. To what degree or in what capacity and to what aspects, we don't know. I don't want to guess. But given the hockey ops side of this, I struggle to believe that this was a hockey only decision. His contract is $5.25 million a year through this season and next in terms of the cap hit. So let's talk now about how he cleared. Because obviously when, when Jacob Rana goes on waivers, 31 other teams are perking up. Only so many of them can take on $5.25 million. Of course, he can make moves. Um, GMs, when they really want to make something work, will make something work. But for $5.25 million a season, it's not a small contract. Um, I know people are, some people kind of push back on that. They're like, it's only for another season and it's not exactly $9 million. It, You really have to understand how tied up against the cap teams are right now, especially with the limited cap growth that we've seen over recent years because of COVID and things like that. Like There are not a lot of teams with that amount of cap space just floating around. That's not really the way the NHL operates anymore. Most teams spend at least close to the cap, even those who retain cap space, um, except for or a, a sample few any given season. So there was only a handful that really could take a look. One of them being the Anaheim Ducks, whose GM was Steve Eisman's assistant GM as of last season. So there's one off the board right there because there's uh, uh, there was a lot of conversation. And I think this may have credence of, uh, you know, there's a lot of, handshake agreements between gms there's a, it's a very in group it's more of a we all know that exists without having someone directly say that to us oh 100 like it's if that didn't exist we'd see offer sheets left right and center yeah uh and, and gms are, are it's much more of a brotherhood than people would want to give it credit for uh i know it's not really it's it's like it or not that's what it is exactly it's not the best for competition but that's what it is so there's definitely something here where uh, the contract scare teams away. There's definitely something here where Steve Eisman may have said to other GMs or implied to other GMs, like, hey, look, uh, this is a guy who needs more time to get things right. He's had a lot going on. He just got, a, got out of the player assistance program. Um, he wouldn't be, be being waived otherwise. You know, don't. Uh, there's a million different conversations. And like you said, Brad, that that. I call it a black box. No information comes in, goes in, and no information comes out for really good reason uh, with the player assistance program. And that just, it obfuscates, it stops us from really knowing the full story um, as to why. But something pushed every other GM away from one of the most effective offensive players of the last few seasons. Ely Tolvanen went down to like the 20s before he got claimed. Like He slid past a lot of teams, and his contract was way lighter and he was a substantially uh, less talented player than Jacob Verona. So I understand those are, are counter to each other, but still, like, it's it's hard to take on that cap hit, and Verona's situation is is complicated. I'd say GMs are usually risk-adverse. Adver- they, they like to, well, a lot of them make bad moves, but um, they make good moves too, and, you know, yeah, Verona's ex- exceptionally efficient at scoring goals at the NHL, but... So a lot of GMs who, you know, probably got excited to see that he was on waivers and, you know, you got to sell your owner on taking on five and a half million bucks for a guy who's only played 36 games in the last two years. There's maybe a lot of owners that don't want to do that. You know, there's there's a lot of uncertainty in the entirety of the situation. And I, I feel like that probably made a lot of GMs uh, shy away from it. I, I think... Ryan, going back to the second point you made kind of explains it more than the first point because 
Verona's cap hits 5.25, and, and yeah, like you said, 70 to 80% of the NHL just could not fit him under the cap right now as it is. But GMs aren't stupid, and, you know, outside of Philly, they're not that lazy when things get hard. If a player of that goal scoring ability comes available, they can, they will make the cap room. Like if we flip the situation, let's say Verano hypothetically was still in Washington, Detroit was in a playoff spot, hoping to compete and him and his contract popped up on waivers right now. And the Red Wings were, you know, one or two million cap space. They, and, and they were serious about winning. They would dump Nadelkovich's and Ernie's contract so fast to make that happen. And I, I would believe that other good teams would do that. But leading to the second part, you know, we all know about that, the fabled uh, GM email chain group, whatever you want to call it. That's a real thing. Yeah. So Eisenman could have sent out, hey, we're waving him. He's struggling. Like, we're just doing this to help him. Like, and then, you know, put whatever justification in there. Obviously, he can't control it a GM if a GM goes rogue, but this could be the human end of sports, which we, you know, haven't even talked about um, the football world right now, how the human element can play, yeah. can play a huge role in this. Um, so so it, it could be that, you know, I, there's some sketchy GMs out there. I have not a hard time, but I, I could believe it if, if a GM was willing to go rogue. I'm just like, fine, we'll fix him. But that's what does it for me, though, right? Yeah. And and I'm sorry to cut you off, but really, it it has to be more than just the conditioning because some GM who does not care how scary Steve Eisenman is and or, uh, you know, they don't believe necessarily in the brotherhood superseding a an offensive talent like that on your team, they would say, well, shit, let him get conditioned on our AHL team. If he's not going to be in game shape for two months, okay, I'll, we'll, we'll do it in our system. Who cares? The the simple, non-complicated solution is that w- for the amount of teams that could actually make a move to fit the cap space, there probably weren't any GMs who were willing to go rogue, as you described. But in all reality, I would probably you know base this on it. this is a much bigger, complicated human situation. And it, it probably, if I had to guess was something like, hey, he needs time. Yeah. I would find it, I found it very hard to believe that Steve Eisen wouldn't be extremely certain about Verona clearing waivers. If he thought there was any chance that it could possibly not happen, I don't think it would have. Yeah. So I, I, I know everybody freaked out. Obviously, everyone's freaking out when as soon as it gets announced and then, you know, you let the dust settle a little bit and it's like, I just found it very hard to believe that Steve Eisenman wasn't 100% certain on this decision that it would play out in, his, in the way he envisioned it. Yeah, that, that's what it boiled down to for me. Not that Steve Eisenman's infallible at all. No, no, certainly not. But you don't have to be a good GM to know that waving Jacob Verona is a big risk. So it's either you're certain he's going to clear or there's something that we don't know. And then big open end to the rest of that sentence. Yeah, and... You know, the one thing that I think we've, we've discounted, we haven't talked about, and I didn't see much on Twitter, but it it might actually be this the explanation here. And I haven't even mentioned it. There's many GMs who are risk, I shouldn't say many, most GMs are risk averse. And this is a very talented player with, you know, deficiencies on the ice coming out of the player assistance program with a decent cap hit they might have just went not risking it just simply not gonna risk it i well they I would have call. a hard yeah and i have a hard time believing some of the basement dwellers in the nhl wouldn't take that chance if eisenman didn't throw out like a precautionary like hey here's why we're doing this because again pat verbeek anaheim they can use every little bit of help they can get and i don't even mean in winning hockey games, I mean, if you can get Verana and you can get him right, that's a valuable trade piece for that's, a team that's rebuilding. And that's honestly why I thought, you know, if there was no trade ever really rumored or circulated, that this was a, a very clear, certain thing that it would clear, right? Like, you think Wings would retain half, move him to half the league, and that would be it. But we never really heard any 
any murmurs of that. So Verona clears, obviously, 24 hours later at 2 p.m. Eastern, we get the news that Verona clears. It was almost unsurprising at that point for the reasons that you guys just stated. And then the conversation moved to, well, what's next? Okay, Verona clears. Uh, some folks were worried, okay, is he going to report? Yeah, obviously, he played the, that very night with Grand Rapids. Um, and then it, it it was, okay, is this genuinely just that he needs more time? Uh, there was a report out there that Verona and his camp felt that they were ready. There was speculation based on the fact that Verona has been deleting, you know, all Red Wings things from his social uh, media. I hate to talk about that. I don't think it's I, – I, I just – there's so much that goes into that. It's not worth paying much mind to, but he did, in fact, scrub a lot of Red Wings related stuff from Instagram and Twitter. Not all that happened uh, the other day. A lot of it happened around the time when he went into the player assistance program. Anyhow, I digress. Um, there was a lot of confusion. But yeah, Verona ended up playing and reporting in uh, in Grand Rapids the same night that Alex Nedeljkovic played his first game in Grand Rapids. Um, and so what's next? Is this just... You keep him down there until he gets right uh, in terms of his physical conditioning. Um, are they going to wait for an injury in the Red Wings lineup? How close is he? Do they? Are we going to see him back in a Red Wings jersey this season? There's a lot that goes into this. Um, and understandably, it's all a big question mark. No one really can divine what these are, what these, uh, the answer to these questions are. But I just don't think it's going to be anytime soon, really, where we see Verona in a, in a Red Wings jersey. So obviously... With Verona clearing, this buys the Red Wings a lot of time because he can now stay in Grand Rapids for almost as long as they need him to, whatever the end of that tunnel is, if that's a trade, if that's bringing him back and becoming a regular Red Wing, if that's figuring out off-ice stuff. Again, just going to leave it at that. Not sure what that works out to, but now they have time because they don't need to rush a conditioning stint, whatever you want the word conditioning to include in this scenario. They have a couple months to the trade deadline if that's the angle they want to take. I I really don't know. If the goal is to trade him, I have a hard time believing they're not going to want to give him at least one more look in Detroit to pump up the value. You know, the old pump and dump, as we refer to it yeah. in trade talks. I don't, I don't know. There's no way to know, but they have options and they have time now. As long as we're putting on tinfoil hats, here's a theory. Yeah, Eisenman sent him through waivers before the conditioning stint was up. So he said, oh, I'm sending him down. Basically, he made the move before he had to. Um, and that... You know, the simple solution to that is that, okay, there's something else going on or uh, whatever, everything that we've just speculated on for the last 20 minutes. Or it could be Eisenman saying, evaluating the playing field, looking at the GMs who could, in all reality, make a move, saying, I know that this handful of seven or eight GMs won't do it. Now is my time to strike where I know guaranteed I can get them through waivers. Because if I do it now, then we absolutely have Verona down in Grand Rapids and we can take as much time as possible. But if I try to wait a week, then things might change. The playing field might change. And how often are you almost guaranteed to be able to get Jacob Verona through waivers? That's a little bit harebrained to, to knock my own theory there for a second, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you still wave Jacob Verona over Adam Murray. You're, you're still saying there, I'm comfortable losing Jacob Verona. So that, uh, there's nuance, there's context. We we could talk for three hours about the nuance and the context, but you boil it down to that statement, and, and that's ultimately what it is. But still, buying the time is, is ultimately what the Red Wings have done for themselves here. It's what Steve Eisman did here, and whether or not the story is, is more or less complicated than what's visible to people, yeah, the Red Wings now can do really what they want in terms of allowing Verona to get his, his uh, feet under him allowing him to kind of continue to work on himself as a person uh, and support him within the organization still. I, that's worth stating, as you've alluded to, Brad, more attention needs to be paid to the human element here. You hope at the end of the day, no matter what, that Jacob Verona, the person, is okay. So he's played a few games with Grand Rapids, and it's not been great. Like, he's not been good yet. He's, it's not Jacob Verona of old. He doesn't have 
really any production to speak of. Um, so it's not really a mystery as to why they think he's not close to being NHL ready. So ultimately, what I would love to see is, you know, whatever the end goal is for the Red Wings with what they want to do with Jacob Vrana, the asset, um, and, and the player in the contract, is that we do see him at some point this season. Had he not played in Grand Rapids last night, or if there was more, you know, drama or, or speculation surrounding that, then yeah, I could buy into there's something even bigger here, and and I'm not sure if we'll see him. But the fact that he was, you know, smiling and in, in pregame warm up and playing for Grand Rapids, I think this all you can really speculate about right now is just where's his conditioning at, how ready is he to play in the NHL, and that's what you follow along. So, what a uh, a messy 24 hours. What a shock. All the all the pieces, all the, the signs were pointing to, yeah, Adam Ernie's going to get waived here. Nedeljkovic sent down for a conditioning stint, and Verona and Fapri were going to come back. And then we had the most shocking waiver 24 hours in, I think, modern Red Wings history, at least. Until next week. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, I don't even want to hear it. <laughs> Tyler Bertuzzi placed on waivers. Oh, but don't put that evil on me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, before we continue this conversation, I want to let you know that this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by NordVPN. Are you missing out on a game or your favorite show because it's not available in your region? Let me introduce NordVPN. Using NordVPN and a click of a button, you can watch and browse as if you're elsewhere in the world, making sure you never miss a game and can watch whatever content you'd like. No need to travel across the continent or oceans for your favorite team when NordVPN brings them right to you. With over 5,000 server options, no game or show is out of your reach. Using our special link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel, you can receive a huge discount on NordVPN's cybersecurity two-year plan plus four free months. We all love to binge, but privacy is a big deal too. NordVPN keeps your information encrypted so you never have to worry about your IP or location getting out. They've also doubled down on keeping you safe with their new threat protection feature. Say goodbye to intrusive website ads and malware. Even if you download an infected file, threat protection kicks in and deletes it before it makes a mess of your computer. Don't forget, there's literally no risk to you at all with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Give it a try, and if you like it, great. If not, they'll issue a refund, and you can pretend the entire thing never even happened. Check out our special link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel, to get your discounted subscription started today. So that was a lot about... uh, uh, Verona specifically and how the waivers affected him and his status on the Red Wings and in that part of the lineup. But there were, you know, a lot of knock on effects here too. And let's start to talk about Alex Nedeljkovic and Derek Lalone coming out and saying, Hey, uh, we still believe in Ned and they're holding an active roster spot for him. And they're sending him down to Grand Rapids on, on this conditioning stint. They're still giving him, you know, an opportunity here to, to get right. So what, is next for Ned. He went down to Grand Rapids yesterday, played one game, made 26 of 27 saves in a Grand Rapids Griffins win, uh, was the first star of the night, uh, was essentially the inverse story of, of Verona. Uh, Ned went down and was impressive right away. Um, how surprised are you that they have decided to stick with him for now? And uh, and what do you see as the path forward for Ned? Not surprised at all. First star of the night, he's fixed. <laughs> Just like that, he has his rhythm back. Just like that, we're all good. I'm not unsurprised that they decided to try to stick this out with Ned. Um, You know, you have to couple it with the Verona information as well, because if they knew they were doing that, they knew they had more time than we thought they had. So might as well get him on a conditioning stint, see if that helps at all. Um, This tells me that they don't love what they've seen from Helberg. Even if they're happy with it and okay with it, they're not completely sold. So it, it's still worth trying to fix Ned. And, you know, obviously we've known this whole time. Ned has a higher seeing, ceiling than Helberg. We've seen it. So it's just a matter of getting him back there. Um, as with everything we've talked about, when you have time, use it. There's no sense wasting it. So, you know, with whatever the circumstances around Verona, they knew that was coming. They knew they were going to have... Uh, an extra week or two to to work with Ned here. So you might as well do it. And, you know, it was a good start. And in a perfect world, he regains his form and all is right in the world. If it doesn't, then they have their answer. No sense dragging this along any further. 
especially like we said with uh, Zadina and Bertuzzi coming back next week. You know, we we talked last episode, hey, this is the week. Someone's going to have to be put on waivers. Things are going to have to happen, and they did. And we can sit here right now and say next week the same thing's going to happen again. I don't know if they're going to have the luxury of uh, carrying three goalies past two of these thresholds. So, you know, good on Ned for for accepting it because the player can decline the conditioning stint if they feel they don't need it or don't want it. So Ned's like, I want to play, and he did it. Um, And then he went down there and he played well, so good on him. That's a testament to his character. A couple more games, hopefully, before another decision has to be made. And then, you know, I I thought this was going to be the week of decision time, and it ended up not being uh, being it to everybody's surprise. But I think next week, or at least whatever Bertuzzi and Zadina's timeline ends up being, is going to be the next deadline. So Derek Lalone is hopeful that Bertuzzi and Zadina are eligible to return on their West Coast road trip from January 16th through 19th. That would be the Colorado game on the 16th, Arizona on the 17th, and then Vegas on the 19th. So right around when Ned's conditioning stint will be ending. Like you said, there's another threshold coming up here. Um, That's two incredibly tough teams and a God-tier goalie at Arizona who will absolutely ruin your life on any given night. Yeah. Um, They have a winning record at home. Not Man, you know what? (laughs) If you told me that right when they announced what that arena would be, I still wouldn't be surprised because you have to lean into that atmosphere to make it your own. They have no other choice. But good for them. But yeah, yeah. Vimelk is a freak. I, I I love every time he, well, it's mostly the Maple Leafs <laughs> he beats up on or that Arizona beat up on. Uh, but yeah, those are going to be three very real tests. I, I mean, that's a foolish statement for me to make at this point. Every test for the Red Wings is a very real test. It's either a team that they should be beating or a tougher playoff team in the NHL. On a side note, do you think that Bill Armstrong has been watching Vimelka's unreal performance this year, and then he's watched Connor Bedard's unreal performance in the World Juniors and just started throwing darts at a Carol Vimelka picture in his office? <laughs> Accidentally put him on the wrong plane. <laughs> yeah. So, well, first of all, Bertuzzi and Zadina. It's notable that they keep raising Zadina's name. If you ask me, Zadina doesn't slot into this lineup regularly right now, and we've talked about this. Uh, he'll have to earn his way back, and a lot can happen in, I mean, that is one, two, three, four, five games at least from now, not counting any of those road trip games. Um, does Zadina come in right away? Do you give him a look right away? What happens there? So this is the catch-22. Zadina probably should have to earn his way into the lineup. How the hell does a guy who's not playing do that? Right? We want 10 years of job experience right out of school. Yeah. Used to that. Yeah. So on that note, the only thing Zadina can do to do that is practice. And Lalonde has said in uh, one of his pressers, Zadina's look good in practice. I mean, we've heard this story before, so I'm not... (laughs) I'm not saying Zadina is coming back and and, Hurt me and twice. he's yeah. I'm not saying he's coming back and he's fixed. But what I am saying is, if he's got to quote unquote earn his spot, it sounds like he's doing it in the only way he can. So, y- yes, I lean to he's going to get a look. He'll he'll draw back in the lineup. And again, you can call it whatever you want. And I'm I always feel bad talking about players like this in these circumstances. And I feel bad that it's always Adam Ernie we dump on, but. I'm going to use him because he was the healthy scratch. So when these two come back, my gut feelings tell me it's going to be him him and one of the goalies who gets waived to make room for these two guys. It's good the Red Wings are competing this year, but this is still a, a season very much based on, you know, readying the future. We know what Adam Ernie is, and more importantly, we know what Adam Ernie isn't. We don't know what Philip Zadina is. We don't know what Philip Zadina isn't yet fully. But the one thing we can confidently say, Zadina's ceiling is higher. Whether or not he ever hits that is a huge question mark. But his Zadina, but Zadina's ceiling is definitely higher. So if you have to, it's a bad word to use, sacrifice Adam Ernie to get <laughs> confirmation on what Philip Zadina is. It's no active volcano in yeah. Detroit. We're okay. <laughs> yeah, we're good. If if you have to wave Adam Ernie to ultimately find out once and for all if Philip Zadina can do it, you have to do it. 
Now, again, it might not be Ernie. You know, pick your guy. Maybe Soderblom gets cold. Maybe Valeno gets cold. Maybe I, I, exactly I don't know. There's, yeah. I'm just using Ernie because he was the scratch this week. So he seems like the most likely candidate. But in, in reality, that's probably what this is. This is Philip Zadina's last and final audition with the Red Wings before they ultimately decide what he is. Now, when I say that audition, I don't mean it's like two weeks. I mean this season. But you got to get him in the lineup in order to do that. And if he has a good finish to the season, great. You've got him under contract for two more years under a, a really affordable deal. If it doesn't work out, it won't be a hard contract to trade and could be a change of scenery type trade. They could be a, all right, Edmonton, here's Zadina. We can't figure him out. You figure him out. Edmonton goes to Detroit. All right, here's Pooley Yarvey. We can't figure him out. You figure him out type of situation. I'm using Pooley Yarvey as an example. There's, 10 guys in the NHL who probably fit this description. Yeah. But yeah, you can't do that in practice. He has to play games. It would even be fine. You know, we always say like, if they're going to play six minutes in the NHL, they may as well play in the junior leagues and dominate. But in this case, I'd rather Philip Zidina be in the lineup and force his way higher into the lineup and, you know, create his own lux, so to speak. I, we obviously believe that he can, but him sitting in the press box and only practicing isn't going to do it. So forcing him into the lineup, even on the fourth line at this point, I think is better than just being a practice player. I agree. I would not fault Derek Lalonde if he said, hey, um, the standard of Robbie Fabry and what we know he can bring to the middle six, or let's say things had gone differently with Jacob Rana or whatever, that justified potentially waving Adam Ernie. Uh, but Philip Zadina, what he's demonstrated, hasn't, and so we are going to wait for something to happen. I wouldn't fault Derek Lalonde for that. No, I, th- I think they're they're fine either way here. And like I said, and as Brad alluded to, there are five games before this road trip even starts, and that's assuming Zadina's ready on the 16th. Any one of the waiver eligible kids could go completely cold. There can be an injury. There probably will be an injury. We're at that point in the season now where the the wear and tear is starting to pile on. Uh, there are guys who are playing with injury. Robbie Fabry is not even going to play both games of the Florida Toronto back to back. Just for example, um, there are going to be. Op- I, I would probably bet that it's not even going to come to having to make a decision. The more important player here, in any case, is Tyler Bertuzzi. The Detroit Red Wings' most important player story right now, even though we just spent near on forty minutes talking about Jacob Verana, the Red Wings' most important player story right now is Tyler Bertuzzi. What is he going to do for these Red Wings? Because we've not really seen him play consistently this season. What is he going to do in, after two brutal hand injuries uh, into surgery? What's he going to do uh, to demonstrate that he can play in the loan system? And he's currently without a contract and no trade protection, so he can be moved before the deadline. There is a less than two-month countdown going on right now, and the focus is going to start to zero in on Tyler Bertuzzi. This is an opinion based entirely on vibes, so take it with that. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the show. <laughs> I I can't shake the feeling that he's just, he's gone. You know, like, I've not heard anything about contract negotiations. I've not heard much at all in the way of Bertuzzi's future with the Red Wings from the organization or otherwise. Yeah. Which, again, it's Iserman and his vault, so you never say never. But, you know, we're even we're getting updates on Dylan Larkin's contract negotiations. As vague and as sparse as they are, we're getting them. Yeah. It's like two guy, one guy sits down at the park bench, puts his briefcase down, and the other guy sits down, puts down his, and they swap, they swap. and go their yeah. own ways. That's kind of what it feels like. Or you have Biz just outright asking the TNT game, uh, pregame show, and you can see Dylan Larkin's robot <laughs> brain just shut down. <laughs> But, again, as comically vague and infrequent as those updates are, we're getting them. I've, none of that has come out for Bertuzzi. Not one peep. And for as good as Bertuzzi is, if uh, if that was happening, we would have known. So they got to get him in the lineup because if they are planning on trading him, well, his trade value is not very high right now. Yeah. So they, they need him in the lineup, and they need him going on an absolute heater. He's got to play on the first line. He's got to play two minutes of every power play. Yeah, like it doesn't matter. Like you have to, whether you plan on keeping him, which is still possible. 
is still possible. And if you gave me control over the hockey world, that would be my preferred option because players of the Bertuzzi archetype are hard, hard, hard to come by. If if you can say, hey, Tyler Bertuzzi is going to stay healthy and continue to be this kind of player, I would say I would love to have him on the Red Wings for the next eight seasons. But I do agree with you, Brad. I, I don't want to leave you out in the lurch. My gut also says this is trending towards Bertuzzi being moved. Um, but in whatever direction you think it's going, yeah, it, it has to start with Bertuzzi coming into the lineup, being forced every opportunity you can give him, and then hopefully something takes. It's just like... I just want resolution at this point. Well, like March get, 3rd's coming fast. Yeah, get him into the lineup that gives you basically a month and a half uh, to see what you got, and you make a decision. If they don't trade him, that's hopefully a, a good sign that they're going to sign a contract with Tyler Bertuzzi, which I believe would be excellent for the team for obvious reasons. But, you know, it's the next you know, 20 games or so or 15 games is going to be like a huge indicator of what you're going to get with and from Tyler Bertuzzi. Can you imagine you told us preseason that <laughs> Jacob Verona and Tyler Bertuzzi, we'd be talking about whether or not they'd be able to play, you know, their first games or their first handful of games in a Red Wings uniform, say for maybe a couple at the beginning in January. February, March, like this, a lot has gone right for Detroit this season and a lot has gone wrong for Detroit this season. And I'm not one to, I'm not trying to make excuses because like, oh, it's a new coach and he has to do well. So the blast show firing is justified or, oh, it's Steve Eisman's the GM and he can do no wrong. It's genuinely none of that. But if you look at what's gone wrong for Detroit this season, there are some honest things that I haven't loved. You know, I, I'm still not sure about the Ben Sherratt, you know, contract and, and, how he's meshed with uh, Mo Sider, that hasn't gone as planned, at least so far. Um, but there a lot has gone right. Peron, Kubelik, Huso. Uh, Rasmussen. Rasmussen's been great. Like, Berggren's been phenomenal. Valeno's having himself a great season. Larkin is, despite being injured as always, you know, doing fantastic. A lot has gone right. The things that have gone wrong have been almost outside of Detroit's control. How much different of a season would this be if they had, you know, however many games, 35, 40 games of Jacob Verona and, and Tyler Bertuzzi up until this point? I know that's every team goes through injuries, but you almost couldn't have picked two worse players to have those injuries. Like, yeah, Raymond Sider and, and, and Larkin are in that mix, but Verona and Bertuzzi, you add the contract uh, or you add the scoring context to that, like, those are like Achilles heels for, for what could have been a much more successful Detroit season. Well, when you put it into like full context, Verona, Bertuzzi, Fabry, Raymond. That was their top four wingers last year. <laughs> Excellent. Good, good stuff. And yeah, so if you said, hey, they're going to be losing three of them for basically the entirety of this season to this point. But they've improved as a team. Oh, you do a backflip. If you went back and listened to like our pre Red Wing season like lineup prediction, oh god, it would just be comedy hour. Oh yeah, some there's probably the coldest takes of all time in that episode. One, one of us at some fault, point. <laughs> one of us at some point. I don't know. <laughs> I guarantee you, one of us at some point said top six Zadina. Oh, a hundred percent. I think we, probably, I think we did, but we probably qualified it. Like if everything goes right. Yeah. yeah. Larkin's <laughs> probably going to be centering Raymond and, and Zadina. Zadina's oh, going to, you know, have a chance to go for 30, 40 goals uh, this no, year. No, no, no. I, I don't think we actually <laughs> no. were that crazy. No, but oh, man. Yeah. It, it's my, my, I remember my hot take was the Red Wings are going to have multiple 30 goal scorers this oh, year. Not even gonna, you, As just, of right now, they're not going to have one. You bum. You did this. <laughs> And the two guys I was betting on haven't played. Someone responded to me because um, I I posted something about I shouldn't I shouldn't have run my mouth so much about wanting to the Red Wings to find a way to keep Ned because that meant Verona got waved and that was the monkey paw curling. Yeah. The amount of responses I got that were <laughs> you did this. I was like, yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, okay, we haven't talked about the Detroit Red Wings game against the New Jersey Devils. It was on God. national television. They lost five one. They they scored their one at the end purely to spoil a shutout. 
I'm not going to say it was their worst game of the year, but it was one of the weirdest thumpings Detroit has received all season. But it was a thumping, and it was just not a good game. When you look at the analytics, it wasn't that bad, though. I thought Vanacek played really well. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. There, there's more of that monkey paw, because guess what Vanacek hasn't done recently? Played, played very well. well. <laughs> uh, you know what? Fabry, for playing his first hockey in a long, long, long time, I thought he looked I thought he looked decent. I, I was uh, it was promising play from him. I, I felt yeah, he kept up. Yeah, which was better than I was expecting. Five on five hockey wasn't terrible either. No, nope. P- penalty kill. Uh-huh. <laughs> Remember that success story? What happened there? Yes, power and it, play. And it wasn't just that game. It's been a trend. Yep, three uh, or two power play goals to start the game, both in the second period, and yeah, they just not good. Special teams was just not good. Everybody just on the first. Dougie Hamilton goal, everybody just backed right in and probably shouldn't give a guy like Dougie Hamilton all the room in the world to put a puck on net. And uh, I think it was Wallman created basically the perfect screen in front of Huso, and it was a... He does it all, Wallman. He's an all-tools guy. <sighs> yeah, it looked pretty easy for, for Dougie on the first one. Well, don't worry. The Red Wings learned their lesson because on the next Devil's Power Play, Dougie Hamilton <laughs> got the puck at the point, and they all backed in, and Hamilton fired one through. That th- This time, he sure tipped it. Yeah. Huso was in the right spot. Tip was just excellent. I I don't know. I can't really blame Huso. I think for either of those two goals, the Red Wings are at the point in the season where one of five on five or special teams at least is burning them, and they are no longer consistently getting god tier goaltending. Like Huso, like th- th- we said a lot. Like Huso, that wasn't sustainable from Huso. If it was sustainable, then he'd be in Vesna talks, and the Red Wings would be making the playoffs. Um, they're getting you know a normal night from an above average goalie a lot of nights, and then one of the two major facets of their team is absolutely tanking, and that's the result you're going to get against a team like New Jersey. They need to, they, Ryan. We weren't supposed to use that word this year. I uh, want I the T word. Yeah, we don't use the T word. Yeah. yeah if, you, if you have watched any World Juniors, I think everyone wants to use the T word right now. The the second tier of teams that like weren't using the T word. Why do you think we've waved? Verona. Yeah. It <laughs> begins. Like, damn it, we're doing we're part of this. <laughs> can't can't risk improving. Now like the Vancouver's of the world are gonna be like, you know what? You know what? It it, it might sound ridiculous, but there might have been teams who are like, Why would we want Verona right now when we just want to be worse? Phenomenal point, actually, Evan. I, I don't even think that's ridiculous. If you're a bottom feeder. Why would Anna why no, why would to Columbus, to, Arizona, Chicago, Arizona why would they even risk it? Two more points. If Verona gives you one more win, two more points could could give you the best odds to the fourth best odds. Like if this is the Owen Power year, yeah, maybe you're not worried about it so much. But when you're watching Connor, Connor Bedard literally tear apart the World Juniors as a 17 year old, you're scratching Vamelka for the rest of the season. <laughs> uh, okay, very quickly, the Red Wings have Florida on Friday night and Toronto on Saturday night. I'll That's, be there. That is boots on the ground. Boots on the ground. You make sure. I don't know. I'll ask Dylan about his contract situation. I'll yeah, get, I'll get the inside scoop. Do it five minutes before you jump on the ice. Yeah, or as soon as he he's coming off for warm up, I'll flag him down. Yeah, and say mean things about Mitch Marner to throw him off his game or something. Apparently, like that. that's really easy to do. Yeah, well, find his dad. That's right. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we'll be back with you uh, with an episode on Sunday. Let's talk about the World Juniors. Some quick context. It is currently 6 p.m. Eastern at the time of recording on Thursday, so the gold medal game has not started yet. We are recording after the bronze medal game has concluded, which was an 8-7 overtime victory for the States over Sweden. Uh, first, Czechia and Sweden. Juracek comes in with, what, 30-something seconds left? I think it was 40-something seconds left. Slap shot from the left side, ties it. Uh, Sweden has a puck that is... As- Literally on the goal line in overtime that doesn't cross. The goal was saved, and then uh, Czechia wins it in overtime to send themselves to the gold medal game. That team is so impressive, this this tournament, man. They have been the best team this tournament. They don't have a regulation loss. When, when they went through, my first thought was whoever of Canada or the States goes through is going to have an immensely tough test. And I thought that because... Czechia won over Sweden. Like, what kind of turn- tournament is it where I thought Sweden would have been the easier opponent for either of the North American teams? It's yeah, been well, an excellent World Juniors. Like, yeah, it's nice to see a team like Czechia take the next step, and they have been excellent. Canada, U.S. Ah, uh, tradition like any other. <laughs> it, the only shame is that not every game between them can be a gold medal game. Uh, 
that comes at no discredit to Czechia, who very much, very much deserves to be there. But Canada US was was and is always a spectacle. Um heartbreaker for the states though. They went up to nothing. Canada came in. I've had a I've had a lot of criticism of the way that Canada's played this tournament. We've talked on previous episodes, like too much hero puck, too much here, Connor, do something. Um it, no, it's still been that pretty much all tournament. It, all tournament. They hear Connor do something that's that's been apt. I'm right here for this. that though. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm like it, it's it it burned them against a team like the States that was they they looked like way more cohesive of a team, cohesive of an uh, attack. They were shutting down the Canadian uh, uh, offense almost completely to start the game. They went up two nothing, and I went unless Canada completely turns around the way they're playing and they get a lot of luck, they're not winning this. Yeah, they they had to get away from the the playbook of have Connor Bedard just do cool shit. They had to, you know, anyways, and then Connor Bedard scored. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, he's going to do it. It's Connor Bedard. Even my friends who don't watch hockey are just like, eh, and there it is. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Con- uh, Connor's doing his thing. Even a game where everyone is selling out to shut down Connor Bedard, he will still trickle one through. And it'll be a disappointing game for him that it's only one, but yeah. He only had, what, three points that game? Only? Slow, absurd. Slow game for him. Literally absurd. Yeah. His points per game average went down. I kid you not. That is ridiculous. <laughs> he he now holds Canada's all time record for a points in a single tournament. Period. Not just including seventeen year olds. Full stop. He holds the Canadian record for most points ever, like all World Juniors combined, and he accomplished that by seventeen years old. It is, and he is. It's unlikely to hit Forsberg's all time points record, which is. 31 in a single tournament, but the fact that Bedard's within striking range of that, even if he's like five or six points off, is insane. Like, Forsberg got that record by dropping 10 points on Japan in the early 90s. And we're sitting here in 2023 with no Japan in the tournament, and Bedard took an honest-to-God run at that record. That is Mind blowing. So Canada ends up winning the game six two, and I don't think it was a six two game in terms of balance. I do think the Canadians did exactly what I said was unlikely, which is they turned around and started playing, you know, more of a team game and, and getting contribution from guys that weren't just Connor Bedard. But the States also had two goals called off that had a lot of people scratching their heads. Well, one of them did. Yeah. It, it was honestly it was a really unfortunate demonstration in my mind uh, of the difference in the NHL versus international rule books. Like by rule, even that first goal where that was called goalie interference, where if that had been waved off in the NHL, I'd be like, are you kidding me? We, we have seen that. In the we NHL, have though. seen it waved off, but that is going to be waved off every time with an international play because the rule book so clearly stipulates increase. If you are in the crease and the goal is scored and the puck is retrieved from outside the crease, brought in and scored, It's no goal. It doesn't matter. It's unfortunate because I think that should have been a good goal in the spirit of hockey. This is is like the reeves Ronick situation. Don't hate the play. Hate the rule the way it's written. Yeah. And even the second goal that was waved off, that would have made it a much closer game for the States. It's like, yeah, okay, he dug the puck out from underneath the goalie. The whistle hadn't gone, but by rule... That that's a no goal in every league at every level. Always you, when the go, when the puck's under the goalie, you you can't pitchfork the goalie and thus the puck into the net. That has never been allowed. Still, uh, six two. Canada moves forward. The states moves into a bronze medal game against Sweden, which <laughs> eight seven is an insane score. As we all projected. Oh man, uh, that was I think. Um, yeah, twenty something or thirty two seconds left, or twenty two seconds left in the third period for Sweden that tied it at seven before Chaz Lucius finished off his hat trick uh, to make that an eight seven win for the bronze medal. So the states walk away with bronze. Obviously, not the result that they wanted, but um, I don't know, a lot of people say that the the bronze medal winners are happier than the silver medal winners. The day of, yeah, maybe yeah. in a couple of years you look back at it. So uh, the the one Red Wings prospect got a medal. Yep, while wearing a letter on his chest. And he had an assist on the a secondary assist on the uh, bronze medal winning goal. Which must have been the most important play that happened to lead to that goal. All game. Yeah, good on you, Red Savage. So 
Canada versus Czechia, we'll have more on that by next episode because obviously the game will have happened by then. Um, but leading into it, I will say I think Canada has a tall, tall, tall task ahead of them. Czechia had, yes, they didn't control the entire flow of, of play in their uh, round-robin win over Canada, but they won the game and they exposed a lot of Canada's flaws. So Canada's going to need to bring their A game to, to win gold there. Yeah, I'm just, I'll get this out of the way. Um, and then, Ryan, you can edit this after. Wow, what a great uh, performance by Connor Bedard and Canada really establishing their skill. Pause, cut. Wow, Czechia just overcame the odds. Really, <laughs> yeah. really plucky group there. They 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 willed their way to a gold. So, I, Ryan, you can edit this tomorrow to whichever one fits better. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not editing any of that. That's all staying in. <laughs> <laughs> that's the magic of podcasting, baby. Uh, okay, there has been so much that's happened. The obviously the waiver news was so monumental. Uh, and the game was so minimal, but we are going to uh, wrap up the the main episode topics there and jump into overtime here. Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to support the show, uh, you get access thing, to things like the uh, Patreon exclusive discord or the Patreon exclusive discord, uh, the official winged wheel podcast discord. Uh, you get access to the Patreon exclusive uh, overtime episodes that we post right after these episodes go up. So any questions that don't make it to the main show. I get posted. Uh, it's an extra little bonus episode where we let loose, have fun, um, and uh, otherwise uh, have some extra conversation. And you get entered into all of our giveaways. We are giving away two tickets to every Detroit Red Wings home game in the season, and the majority of them are going right to our Patreon supporters. All that and more, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Sam W. says, okay, you are right. The Griffins apparently are a bit young, or the D are inexperienced on North American ice, and they are far from a playoff contending team right now. But why are they this bad? There's a lot of reasons. The main one being they're young, young and inexperienced, and they're getting picked on by the older AHL lifers, and I don't mean that in a bad way. There, I, I don't watch enough Griffins games to be able to break this down in any detail, but opinions from people I talk to who are more in touch with the Griffins say there have been a lot of complaints about the coaching and the system is there. I have no idea how much that contributes to it, but I'll just, I'll give it some airtime so that that's something that I've heard. And I think that might really be it. I mean, goaltending has been an issue there this year, but I think it's probably just the first point, the most, and then maybe the second point, a touch. Patrick J says, I know this is going to drive Brad insane. So that's a question that me and Evan love. Uh, but here it goes. If we're in a battle for a playoff spot, I was thinking what it might take for a team to acquire Timo Meyer. Looking through armchair GM on Cat Friendly, it seems as though a first, a third, and a second tier prospect would lo- likely do the trick. How would Bertuzzi, for them to flip, a first and Wallander look? He's a pending RFA, so it realized, I realize it may take more, but figured they may be willing to do this with no salary retention. So that's Timo Meyer as a pending RFA. So you got to the right conclusion with the wrong intention. The Red Wings should absolutely be in on Timo Meyer, but this season has nothing to do with it. Bertuzzi likely won't be able to be in this deal because 90% of significant trades on the trade deadline come right down to the trade deadline, and NHL GMs aren't creative enough to acquire an asset to flip. So as nice of a thought as that is, and we see uh, trade suggestions like this every year, I don't think it's ever happened. Not once. Not with anybody, at least, of Tyler Bertuzzi's significance. Should the Red Wings pull pull the trigger on a trade for Timo Meyer if it's like a, a first, maybe not a 2023 first, but a first and two good prospects? Yeah, they probably should. The, we talked about it last episode. Um I don't. I can't remember if it was on the main episode of the Patreon exclusive, but the Red Wings' biggest hole right now is they lack elite talent, mm-hmm. and they don't have anybody in the system to currently as is to fill that void. I think I used the example of Pasternak last episode, but Timo Meyer could be that guy. He could fill that role. They need guys like this because this team struggles to score. So I'm all in on a Timo Meyer trade. I'm all in on a free agent David Pasternak. I'm all in on a sign and trade for Bo Horvat because. It's the only way it seems like the Red Wings are going to be able to get these guys. But every trade the Red Wings make this year, you should get this season right out of your mind because it doesn't matter. Jefferson Steelflex, which remains one of my favorite names we've seen come up on Patreon, 
Well, if that's your real name, that's metal, literally metal. Um, it feels like the Red Wings uh, have a large number of young and cost-controlled middle to bottom six forwards, but very little in terms of elite top six talent. Do you think it might make sense for us to trade some of those players like Zadina, Valeno, Kubelik, Fabry, or prospects like Cross Hannes to trade for an elite player like Timo Meyer, Alex Dubrinkit, or Pierre-Luc Dubois? Um, yeah, if you can, but it, that's a tough sell for a lot of the reasons Brad just stated. Um, you know, you're going to have a hard time amounting a trade package that contains Zadina, um, or honestly, even Kubelik and Valeno, like for different reasons, they, those would be filler in the trade package. It, I I mentioned it every year around this time, so now is probably the a, a good time to mention it again. If you are making a trade proposal, like you, you're coming up with a hypothetical trade, if you are not uncomfortable with what you are giving up, the trade's not happening. Your your offer isn't good enough. So. Could Zadina Valeno, someone like that, be filler in a trade like this? Absolutely. They will not be centerpieces. They will be the the straw that gets the trade, you know, to completion. You're giving up a first-round pick. You're giving up Edvinson. You're giving up, like, it has to make you uncomfortable or NHL GMs are going to look at it the same way and be like, no, I'm not doing that. Are you crazy? Also, if they want Pierre-Luc Dubois, they're going to have to uh, pick up the LCA and move it to Montreal. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right, this one from Full of Ruth says, Hi, guys. Happy New Year. Uh, Brad, in an earlier pod, you said if Dylan Larkin wasn't signed by the New Year, then it's time to worry. So how worried are we? Oh, I've crossed that 50%, that 50% threshold. I'm officially concerned. I'm not panicking. We're not at that level yet. That will come closer to the trade deadline. But I am concerned because I don't think many... People, us included, thought it would take this long. Yeah, you can't read too much until Larkin's response to Biz when asked pregame. Notoriously, players, like when you're asking those kinds of... Those questions are fair game. I, I want to state this outright, but generally they're avoided pregame. Like, players don't like to talk about that kind of stuff pregame. But from what you can glean, like, it's, it's all standard stuff from Larkin. Like he said, you know, I hope it works out like I want to be here. Um was careful to not to go too far down that path because he's still a player trying to negotiate the most money he can out of a team. And that's all you can pull from that. Anyone I've talked to about this still thinks it gets done. That's what it always boils down to. They say, I still think it gets done. Uh, there's not been indication that there's been animosity. There's not been an indication that it's at an impasse. How, like we said, we, we've had more information on Larkin than we've had on Bertuzzi, um, which is why, you know, I, I stated that Bertuzzi is probably the more of a focal point. But yeah, it's January 5th. There's no contract for the most important centerman in the Red Wings organization right now. They're captain. Arguably the most important forward. That's never going to be fun. You know, we clamored for Steve Eisman to become GM of the Red Wings and we said, you know, he makes the tough decisions and this is what makes him such a cutthroat, uh, uh, hard-nosed GM that builds championship teams eventually. Yeah, this is the uncomfortable part of it. It's not just uncomfortable for him, it's uncomfortable for the fans too. Yep. So yeah, very nervous. I'm I'm from a Red Wings fan perspective more than a little bit anxious and I don't think anyone is wrong to feel that way. I'm going to join the chorus in saying I still think it gets done though. I just hope it's soon. <laughs> um it, not hockey related but before we wrap up here i do want to give a moment uh just to to recognize the very scary incident that a lot of people witnessed on uh, monday night football where damar hamlin um you know uh, collapsed and had to be resuscitated genuinely uh on the field in the nfl so we're sending um all of our thoughts and well wishes to damar hamlin and his family it, we've had some really good news over the last 24 hours that he seems to be recovering well uh all things considered he's still in very serious condition but he's awake responsive with writing um asked if the bills won the game uh one of the most horrifying things i've witnessed you know watching sports over my entire life and um the only, 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 you know, silver lining, if you can even say that, that can be drawn from all of this is the way the entire sporting world has come together in support of, of DeMar Hamlin, his family, the Bills. They found a uh, an old GoFundMe for a charity from like Charity Drive he did like two years ago. It's his um, mom's daycare. His, his mom runs that uh, charity. 
and it's for like a, a toy drive. It's a toy drive, yeah, yeah. Because I, for, I forget the exact context, but yeah, his, his mom runs a daycare in the Pittsburgh area where he's from, and they were doing a toy drive um, through her business, and yeah, it went from a goal of twenty five hundred to last I saw was creeping up on six million. Uh, surges past seven million. Jeez, as of a few hours ago. So that the outpouring of support, it has been heartwarming to see. And you have to know that means the world to, to his family as well. So, um, yeah, that's, there's not really words to articulate how scary it was, but, uh, wishing all the best for, uh, for, for DeMar and hopefully the, the good news keeps coming. Okay. Uh, we're going to wrap up this episode where we're, we're going to be back with you on Sunday. Uh, thank you all for tuning in for, uh, bearing with us as we all kind of parsed our, or what the hell is going on with the Jacob Verona being waived situation together. But uh, wow, well, some kind of week for the Red Wings. We'd like to thank all of our listeners of the Winged Wheel podcast, new and old, uh, all the sponsors of this episode, NordVPN, uh, all of our Patreon, all of our Patreon supporters, our name level sponsors on Patreon, Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Armchair GM slash Genius, Nick Perks, Terry Driver of the number 69, Crying Ryan, Hannes Banana, Simon Jamathong, Glenn Brabham, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Brad Free Ads Crisco, Carl Brutan and Nanaluski. I think he means your uh, your shirts. Oh. Bauer, sponsor us. Chimmy, Chris P, Please. Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, Red Hot Ronick, Hassam Al- Alkasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joseph Barry, Kalen Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Las Enceladas Picantes, Marcus, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, Nedeljkovic goalie number one, Nicholas Fritz, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin. That's what I appreciate about you. The podcasting couch, Venom, Zachary Rogers, uh, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, uh, hashtag LHRW, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landeskog, Ben Barron, LHRW, proud member of the Jake Wellman Gritty Club, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Carl Thames, Connor Leighton and Darren Fick, Philip Zadiz Nuts, G Rated Snowblower Joke 2023, Sad Verona Edition, Heronix Handlebar, James Laporte, Jeremiah Doble, JM Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Linda Hull, Matt S. Loyal Soldier of the Cheesebag Army, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Ricky Bong Reps, Servo, The Enthusiasm Evan Conjures to Sign Christmas Cards, The Hodag. <laughs> Thank you all so very much, and we will talk to you Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.